Okay. So for the last uh, lecture of today, we really welcome uh, Don Chaika for his uh, sixth uh, lecture of his name. Yeah. So let me first make an announcement. Um, the schedule is a little bit different than posted. I think this was announced last week also. But tomorrow, in Martin Legil's slot, I'll be giving my seventh lecture. I will give my eighth lecture as planned, the last slot of the day, on Wednesday. And on Thursday, in the slot that's given to me, Martin will give his first talk, Martin Legil. Okay. All right, so if you guys remember from before lunch, uh, I mentioned the argument I outlined that was sort of based on orbit matching. And I said that it admits two generalizations. I like this, by the way. It admits, I did not draw that. It admits two generalizations, one of which you only need to match a definite proportion of the segments. And this is because of this fact about Cesaro averages and Birkhoff's ergodic theorem giving you that points have to converge. And I mentioned a little bit of a context where this argument can be used. Uh, hopefully, the argument made, some more, it made sense and maybe the context made a little bit of sense, but the argument, I think, is kind of good in most two. I also mentioned something very surprising. It's not important that this matrix A maps my torus to itself. So let's talk a little bit about what I mean by this. Okay? So I can... So this is a nice space, and I can act on it by... So you can think about this as being... The following object, it's just a torus with opposite sides identified. And I can act on this by any matrix, and I'll just get a different torus. Okay? So I can take a, a B, say in GL2R, and I'll get some other torus. My matrix doesn't have to be an SL2 or I could change the size, I just get a different torus. Slide, slide, identified. And this is still a perfectly nice geometric um, picture. Everybody happy about this? In sort of big generality, the directions of my flows will go to directions of my flows over here, and the rate will be changed. What will determine the directions that it goes to? It'll be determined by the action on projective space. This gives you a, ma a map on projective space just on the circle, and just whichever way a direction goes, it goes to the other one, and it'll be stretched or shrunk by some amount, and that'll change the speed of the flow. Okay. So this is a completely general picture. We're going to make a discussion about very specific points where what's happening is sort of more obvious very specific choices of directions and very specific choices of matrices. Okay. So what are my choices of matrices going to be? My choices of matrices are going to have the following form. So I want to consider a rotation matrix, which has the following form, cosine of theta, minus sine of theta, sine of theta, and cosine of theta. And then I want to try to observe a different matrix that has also appeared in Davida's lecture and also in um, Reynolds' lecture. e to the t, 0, 0, e to the minus t. Now, for issues of normalizations, uh, Davida and Reynolds divided by 2, divided by 2 in the exponent, I'm not going to do that. So it doesn't play a role in my arguments. Okay, and that's g sub t, not g sub minus t. So what does this matrix do? It expands the horizontal directions on my torus and contracts the vertical directions. So it'll take this torus you see here and send it to a very long and thin torus. Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right, and I also want to make the observation that gt, R sub pi 
over 2 minus theta will exponentially contract. It's not really that important that it's exponentially. Vectors in direction theta And then just parenthetically and expand vectors in direction theta plus pi over 10. Okay. All right. And so that's not anything fancy going on. What I've done is I've taken my direction theta and I've moved it to the vertical direction and I've now contracted it. Everyone happy about this? Okay, let's start making statements that motivate where I'm going. Okay, so if there exists, so we'll do a theorem. Um, if, uh, if theta is a non-periodic direction, not, is not a periodic direction, sub theta has a u which will be a map of the square torus to itself has a unique invariant probability measure. Borel probability measure. So this result that we've already seen twice already, but for very special directions coming from a matrix A, we're going to replace the action of A by the action of GT, or rotation of this matrix GT. And we're going to pay a price. The price we're going to pay is we're going to change what our torus is. But the, nevertheless, our argument will go through under the assumption that this is not a periodic direction. Okay, everybody happy about this? And this is proved in two steps. So step one, and I'll call this proposition smiley face. Oh, by the way, uh, v theta is the unit vector in direction c theta. But probably more or less clear from notation. And then there's another thing I want to say, which is that f of t sub v, by the way, acts on a comma b in the following way, just as before, by a goes to a plus tv, where this is considered modulo 1, or in the group, tv1, and b gets sent to t plus the second coordinate. Okay. So proposition smiley face, uh, if there exists arbitrarily, oh, let's say there exists, S1, comma, S2, if there exists D bigger than zero, and S1, comma, S2, comma, dot, 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 going to infinity, so that uh, the diameter of my geometric object G1 
sub si of r theta of um, r2 mod z2 is less than or equal to d than f sub t of v sub theta has a unique invariant probability measure. Or our probability measure. Okay. So I claim that secretly the argument I did before proves this result, but we're going to do it towards the end of the lecture. Everybody okay with this? And then step two is I can apply proposition smiley face. So step two. Proposition. Let's say proposition star. Okay. Uh, if theta, uh, there exists a D independent of everything. Uh, it just depends on SL2R, not SL2Z. There exists a D so that um, if V sub theta is not a periodic direction, uh, if theta is not a periodic direction on the torus, R2 mod Z2, then there exists arbitrarily large S. So that the diameter of G of S R theta R squared mod Z squared is uh, less than or equal to D. Okay. So the proof is in two steps. There's a geometric argument very similar to the argument we saw last period, uh, last lecture, where it suffices to uh, deal with the case where the diameter is uniformly bounded. And then there's another thing, which is our assumption here, which is sort of uh, a simple dynamical assumption that you're not a periodic direction on the torus, is enough to use the sufficient condition from proposition smiley face. Everybody happy about this? So let me just say that the proof idea is basically the proof of Mahler's compactness criterion. Okay? What is the way that your tori can be very distorted? It means you have a very, very short vector. Okay? Now, there's two possibilities. The short vector could be in the vertical direction, and it could be exponentially contracted for all time by this. Or it could be in a little bit of a different direction. And what's going to happen is it's going to be its horizontal component is going to be exponentially expanded by this matrix. It's vertical direction is going to be exponentially contracted, and eventually it's going to start expanding again. And a moment's going to happen where it's going to get to be of reasonable size. And at that moment, your matrix will have bound, your, uh, your uh, torus here will have bounded diameter. There is another vector that can't be too short yet, and at this special moment, your sort of geometry will be very nice. So that's just sort of the idea of what's going to happen, and now I'm going to do a bunch of lemmas about this. So let's begin with the following lemmas. Okay, so I want to make a definition. Um, so definition. Um, let B be in GL2R. Um, 
we define the systole of B to be equal to the minimum of the lengths of uh, B, um, let's call this uh, N M. So that N M is in Z squared minus zero zero. And we call a vector attaining this a system. There could be more than one. If there is one, we call it a system. Usually there'll just be one. But in any case, that's the definition of a system. And let's make an a uh, remark here. So if B of R2 mod Z2, if I consider this object here, a shortest side of this in, uh, in some presentation So I look at the shortest side I can have in any possible presentation, and it has length as the systole of these, B. Everybody happy about this? Who's with me on this? because I don't know to what extent people have seen this thing. Almost nobody. OK, so let's do a digression about the dictionary, um, about this dictionary that's going on here. So I've got a torus here, OK? Right. And I've identified this by R2 mod Z2. Right. Everybody happy about this? So what this tells me is it tells me that two numbers are the same if I can add anything in z squared to represent it. So this torus here, though, I could pick another pair of integer vectors that, whose integer span is z squared, and I could get a different representation of this torus that's really just the same object. So for example, I could do this guy here. This is probably the next easiest one. I want to do one, one, and here will be once again, one, zero. Right? And I can have lots of different fundamental domains for this torus as R2 mod Z2, right? Fundamental domains for the action of Z squared on R2. And in general, they're all going to be parallelograms. And they're going to have pairs of sides, which are integer vectors, and which, when you put as columns in a matrix, have determinant 1 or minus 1, depending on the orientation. Everybody OK with that? All right. So this, everything goes through just as well. I act on B, and each one of these fundamental parallelograms gives me a new fundamental parallelogram. But if B is an enormous matrix, some kind of very huge um, uh, it's some kind of very huge matrix, say in SL2R, your original parallelogram is going to be extremely distorted. But maybe there's a better choice of parallelogram that looks kind of nice. Okay? And your systole will, be, will have sides one of those nice presentations, will be the sides of one of those nice presentations. Who's with me now? Great. So now let's make a more precise lemma. Okay? So if B is in GL2R, if B is in GL2R, there is a fundamental domain. There is a fundamental parallelogram of 
um, domain for the r squared mod z squared so that one side is the system has length okay so I just pick that one first Okay, I know that there's some side. This now gives me some side that represents uh, a fundamental um, parallelogram, and I've got a lot of choices for the other side, and I want to make a condition on that other side. And what do I want to do? I want to make sure that the diameter is not too big. So how can I make a parallelogram have a big diameter? I can have a really big side, or I, I need to have a really big side for it. Okay. All right, and so there are various ways you can have really big sides. You can have a very short side and have definite area, or you can have a, two reasonable sides, but their angle could be very small, and you could have definite area still. Okay, so I want to run, rule out this closeness of angle condition, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to be making the system get bigger. So I'll control that thing, and I just need to control the angle condition. Okay. The other side makes angle angle between pi over four and pi over two with this side. And of course, what does this tell me? This tells me that, um, so this other side, this other side, has length greater, I'm sorry, length less than, Uh, the area of my object, so the absolute value of the determinant of B, uh, and then I guess I can just put any, I can put a lot of different numbers here, but let's talk about this. this is okay. Because the area of this parallelogram is going to be the determinant of B, um, and so if you make definite angle, you sort of, you can estimate the length by the product of the two sides with some error depending on how close their, error, their angle is. Everybody happy about this? I don't know what these are fundamental dimensions. Oh yeah, thank you very much for this question. So I've got r squared mod z squared. Okay, so let's talk briefly. So this is a lot like um, Reynolds' lecture. So I've got my plane r squared on it, r squared here, okay? And I've got the action of z squared on r squared. So z squared acts on r squared by translation. Are you happy about that? Okay. And what I can do is I can choose a parallelogram. And really, I want to have one side included and one side not included. And two sides are included. One side is left, uh, two sides are left out. Um, and so what I can do is I can choose this so that, um, yeah, so what I choose is, so I want that the action of B Z squared on um, this thing tiles the entire uh, uh, the entire plane. Okay, so I, let's 
So I have parallelogram. So I consider parallelograms is equal to all of R2 and their pairwise disjoint. Okay, so if you looked at my picture here, this had the property for the identity matrix for uh, R squared. If I move this around, I tile all of the plane. But there's actually a lot of different parallelograms that'll have that property, like this one will also. Okay, did that make sense? And so each of those gives me a geometric representation for this torus that I really want to consider, my B R squared mod Z squared. Okay, did that answer your question? Thank you very much for the question. Okay. Um, let's see how I'm doing on time. Okay. Uh, are people, should, maybe I'll just talk through how the proof of this goes. Okay, so I can subtract off any multiple I want of a systole from a linearly independent side and get another representation of a side of, the funda of these parallelograms, or I can add them. Indeed, the way I went from this to here is I just added the bottom side to the top side. I could have subtracted it. I could have added 58 times that. All of those will give me parallelograms with, which have these properties. Is everybody happy about that? Now, because this is a shortest vector, if you think about what its effect on the angle of the other vector is, it's going to move the other vector, but not by too much. And in fact, if you think about the extreme cases, it can't move you from angle less than pi over 4 to angle bigger than pi over 2, okay, if you subtract this vector from it. And so there has to be some kind of wonderful moment where you land in between these and you just, that's what you're at. Okay, so maybe I'll just write the idea of proof here. So let uh, W be a system and um, W prime and let's let U be another side, another side. Find k so that the angle of w and k w plus u is in pi over 4 to pi over 2. And because W has smaller size than any other possible option for you, so with anything that arises in this way, you can always find such a um, K. That's the idea of the proof. Okay. All right, um, okay, so now uh, we've got proof, now what I want to do is I want to do uh, proof of proposition first. Proof of proposition okay, 
so how is the proof going to go? Um, and because um, psi is an a is not a periodic direction. Direction. For r squared mod z squared. Uh, r squared r to the pi over 2 minus pi times z squared does not have a vector. A vector in the vertical direction. direction means that there's a vector in z squared that's in that direction, okay? I've moved the direction psi to the vertical direction, so there was no vector in z squared in that direction. I've moved that to the vertical, so now the end result is there's no vector in the image of z squared in the vertical direction. There's nothing fancy going on at this point. And our proof will proceed and follows. Um, so, uh, so um, it suffices to show, in order to prove proposition star, that for any that if the system Sorry, John, there is because psi is not aperiodic or is aperiodic and it's not periodic. Is not a periodic direction. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Thank you very much for pointing that out. So, um, so it's a, so it's a thesis to show that if S is a in re the reals and the systole of G sub S of R sub pi over two um, minus psi of uh, r squared mod z squared, did I do, oh no, I, this is just defined as a matrix, is less than a quarter, then there is L bigger than S, L bigger than S, so that uh, the system of G sub L of r of pi over 2 minus psi is bigger than or equal to 1 fourth. So the name of the game is I'm only going to make my arguments when there already is a very, very short side to one of these options of these fundamental parallelograms. Okay? And what that's going to mean is it's going to mean the other side has to be very big. These have determinant one. I have to have a parallelogram that has area one. All of these parallelograms have to have area one. One side is small, the other side has to be huge, the diameter has to be huge. But what I'll find is that if I flow a little longer, then the diameter won't be too then the diameter won't be too big. Because bounding the systole by this computation lets me bound the diameter. That's the whole point. Everybody okay with that? Great. Okay. So that's pretty uh, much straightforward. So um, we're going to make just a very, very good guess of what L is. It's not going to be all that hard of a guess. So we'll let L be equal to the minimum of the set of uh, T bigger than or equal to S. It'll have to be bigger so that this shortest length, this system of G sub T of r pi over 2 minus psi um, is greater than or equal to uh, 1 fourth. And of course, if it's the first time, I'm going to have actual equality. Okay? And why is this? So let's notice that this is defined 
because the horizontal, so if V, so no, if V is not a vertical vector, Uh, then g sub t of v has that its length goes to infinity. Indeed, the horizontal component goes to infinity. So I look at whatever this vector is here, and then I start flowing forward here, and I wait until it becomes length a quarter. Now, it's not hard to also, I guess secretly I'm using that this changes continuously, but that's pretty straightforward. Okay. Now let's also remark that by area issues, by area constraints, it's decreasing, for example, and so you need some oscillations. No, I just need that the length of any vector goes to infinity. Um, so um, it, maybe you won't want my next line. Let me just write my next line. By area considerations, if the system of B is less than, um, say, one half. Okay. It is unique. Up to sign. Its negative will be another one, but those will be the only two. Okay, and that's because they have to span a fundamental parallelogram, and that has to have area one. So in fact, this one half could be replaced by one. So you say that if I see system as a sub, as a connection of the vertices of the mm -hmm. domain, then at some point, so my system will grow, but there will be no other path which will actually jump and be mean and decrease. Correct, correct. Was that your question, Krzysztof? Did I answer your question? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, by area considerations, um, it is unique. So really what I'm looking at is I'm looking at a time where a particular vector crosses from being less than a quarter to bigger than a quarter. That's what the uniqueness gives me here. Okay? And that's why L is defined. Everybody okay with that? So because we know for, for sure that system is um, realized by non-vertical vector, right? So it has non-trivial a horizontal component. Horizontal component which has to expand yeah. so it will grow. Yes. Okay. It will grow, but how much? It goes to infinity. So it's got a, it goes to infinity continuously. And it grows at least until one half. One quarter. Okay, let's go through this because I'm clearly making a botched job of this. So let V be in G S R pi over two minus psi of uh, Z squared minus zero zero. Uh, so that the length of V is equal to the system. Okay. So V is the unique vector with this form, and it's also going to be the unique system as long as its length is less than a quarter. Okay, that's just by a simple area concern argument. So the claim is that as long as, as the length of G sub S plus um, A of V 
is less than or equal to, say, a half of systole of G of S of R of pi over 2 minus psi is equal to the length, uh, sorry, I forgot the plus a, of g sub s plus a of v. Because there's only one system, there's only one shortest guy. This is the shortest guy you got, so as long as it's the shortest guy, you're given by the length. Okay? This guy goes to infinity, and so it crosses a quarter while it's this. Okay? So let me make a remark. Sometimes, pe sometimes people are very cautious about things because they know that there's complicated things. This argument does not work in higher dimensions. You can start saying this whole story about R3 mod Z3, but you can have two short linearly independent vectors. You don't have the uniqueness of the system, so there's nothing like the argument this easily. Okay? All right. Okay, so um, at this point, we've got our L, we've completed the proof of proposition star. Any other questions on the proof of proposition star? Okay, great. Okay. All right, so what we've got is we've cooked ourselves into a situation where our diameter has become bounded. So now I wanna tell you what the next result is. Um, so I next want to make the following lemma. Um, so, uh, um, if the diameter um, okay, so uh, there exists a C depending on D. It's probably something like 2 times D. So that if the diameter of B times my torus, sorry, my torus b r2 mod z squared is less than or equal to d, then there exists uh, in p comma q are in my torus b times r squared mod z squared, then there exists zero less than or equal to a comma b less than or equal to c so that uh, q is equal to p plus a times a vector in direction theta plus b times a vector in direction theta plus pi over 2. Uh, I left one thing out. Theta is in the circle. But it doesn't depend, it doesn't matter. I can uniformly get between any two points in any orthogonal set of coordinates. Okay, that's all that's going on here. Everybody happy about that? Okay. <laughs> This is the unit vector in direction theta uh -huh. and the unit vector. I'm just picking orthogonal coordinates. I don't care where they are. I see, I see. There's nothing going on here. Thanks for the question. Okay, so you guys remember from last time I started out with a lemma like this and then I had a corollary that brought in the flow. Okay? So now we have that if, so correlate, if G 
sub s diameter. G sub s, r theta, r pi over 2, minus theta of uh, r squared mod z squared is less than or equal to d. And p comma q are in my original torus, r squared mod z squared, then there exists. 0 less than or equal to a, comma b less than or equal to capital C, so that q is equal to p plus a e to the minus t v, uh, sorry, e to the minus s, e v theta plus Sorry, it's e to the s, b theta, plus b e to the minus s, v theta, plus pi over 2. All right, so the proof is exactly the same as before, except my tori are different. So this tori goes to some other, maybe a little bit distorted torus. Okay. Clearly, I've changed the area, but pretend I didn't. Okay, I started with my p over q here. <coughs> I end up with an x and y here. Okay, and then I connect these by horizontal and vertical curves. Okay, everybody happy about this? I pull these back. And so when I pull them back, the first thing I apply is g to the minus s. So this direction will be expanded by e to the s, so it gets enormous, and then it'll be rotated two direction pi. I'm sorry, two direction theta. Okay. And this direction will be contracted by e to the minus s, and rotated two direction uh, theta plus pi over two. Okay. And so I'll end up with an enormous line in direction theta and a very short line in direction theta plus pi over two. So this will be direction theta. I'll come very close. And then I close it with a little piece in the orthogonal direction. Everybody happy about this? All right. From here, the proof goes exactly the same as we've seen it beforehand. If I give up a chunk of flow of size a times e to the s, I have now made these differ. So p times flow, so the distance between flowing uh, by t plus a e to the s um, p and q is less than b or equal to b e to the minus s. Because I picked this to be the unit vector. And so this is also less than or equal to c e to the minus s. So after I flow a little, oh, sorry, I, I made a big mistake. I didn't flow my q. So these now flow together with a tiny error, and I can treat that integral I've treated over and over again um, in the same way I've treated it before. Who would like to see me treat that integral again? Oh, who, <laughs> who would like to, me to see that integral, to treat that integral again? Okay, great.
Um, okay. So, is everyone happy that I now have proposition smiley face? Okay, I would like to see. Okay, so let's um, prove proposition smiley face. It suffices to show for any one Lipschitz G and epsilon bigger than zero, uh, the integral of G of F to the T of P minus G of F to the T of Q less than 10 epsilon. Okay. I think I'll end up with a 5 epsilon in the argument. Everybody happy about this? Okay. All right. So now, following a proposition star, I find S lowercase s, so that the diameter of g sub s of r sub pi over 2 minus theta of my torus is less than d. And I also want that e to the minus s is less than c over epsilon. Okay, that's my choice of epsilon. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to pick t to be bigger than, I think it's e to the 2s, but let me check. There might be a constant of a c in there. I don't think it needs to be there. Um, yeah, so let t be bigger than e to the 2s, right, which is e to the s squared. So now I want to treat this integral, and I treat it in pieces as before. So I look at the integral from uh, 0 to t minus e to the s of f of f to the t, nope, g of f to the t plus e to the s of p minus g of f to the t of q. Okay. And then I've got my two remaining small terms. So my two remaining small terms, I have the integral from 0 to e to the s, which by the way is like um, epsilon over c times t of g of f of t of p minus the integral from 1 minus e to the s to 1 of g of f of t of q. Okay, is everybody happy about this? So this is at most uh, e to the s times the diameter of my space. So this is at most epsilon over c times d times t. Okay? And c is actually smaller than d. So I can cross out this with this, get an epsilon of t here. And by my choice here, the one Lipschitz argument, this is very small. Um, Okay, so this is less than epsilon. 
because the length is t. It's term by term less than epsilon. Did that answer everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions at this point? So to my mind, this is one of the highlights of this argument in contrast to the other two arguments I, I'll propose, which is it doesn't care as much about what this is doing sort of on your space. It sort of lets you even move between different spaces. I've thought for a while if there's a way to sort of run the Couden argument um, or the argument I'll show next class where you let yourself change your space. I don't think there is. I haven't figured it out. I'd be really excited if somebody figured it out and you shared it with me. Okay. I now, are there any questions on this proof? I now want to go about explaining this proof in the opposite order in which I have proved the proof. Okay? So I want to reverse the order because I think that's conceptually much more helpful, but actually harder to follow the proof. So I chose to present it the way I did. But, but anyways, um, so what's the idea behind the proof? The idea is I start out with an extremely long trajectory. In the arguments I've presented, I end the argument with an extremely long trajectory, but you start out trying to think about what's the behavior of an extremely long trajectory. You're going in your space and you're winding in some complicated fashion in your space. Okay? And you start with another extremely long trajectory parallel to it. It's also winding in your space in some extremely complicated fashion. Okay. Everybody happy about this picture? You go forward by some dynamics that contract the direction of the flow. So in our case here, it would be my g sub t of r sub pi over 2 minus theta or ultimately it would be my a sub k, and I can track the direction of my dynamics till it becomes sort of reasonable size, possibly on a different object. Okay, possibly on a different object. Um, I now have a different flow here that's also moving in some kind of complicated fashion, and so forth. And I've got another flow here. It's moving also in some complicated fashion. But here, because I've got bounded geometry, everything is bounded, I can just start, I can match up these orbits at some point in the direction transverse to the flow, the direction that will be contracted when I pull backwards. There's a special direction that will be contracted when I, when I pull backwards, and I link up these trajectories in that direction. Now, because of the way my dynamics move, once I link at one point, that's sort of preserved for a while. Okay? Now, when I pull this picture back, what I have seen is a mechanism that makes these very long trajectories travel close to each other, extremely close to each other, for a very long time. And to my mind, that's how this argument actually works. Okay? So you start with an extremely long trajectory. It's ex it's very hard to understand. So you change your geometry to a different setting where your very long trajectory has become reasonable in size. And you hope that your geometry isn't too distorted here. And so you can match up your two reasonable trajectories on a reasonable segment of them. You pull that back, that reasonable segment becomes huge and of definite proportion of the other segment. And you can run that ergodic theoretic trick I discussed at the end of, class, at the, end of the last lecture. Thank you very much for your time, and sorry if I went over it. I did. I was wondering. <laughs> Any questions? So let me just mention, my last lecture will be another argument like this. But my next lecture will be uh, the Hopf argument for mixing due to Martine Babayel. She has a beautiful proof of it that I'm very happy I get to share. <laughs> <laughs>